Hello and welcome. Just realised I didn't unmute myself when I thought I had. Rookie error. Okay, well, welcome to the National Space Academy's takeover of social media. You've just seen all of this in Muted before. Uh, we are taking over the National Space Centre's social media channels this week in order to bring some Q&As with people from across the UK space sector who have really interesting jobs and to give you an insight in some of the things that are going on in UK space right now. Uh, today, I am joined by Chris Ogunlacy, who is an expert in materials for space propulsion from the University of Southampton. Chris, good afternoon. Uh, hi. Hi, Sophie. Hi. hi. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, really excited to listen to what you are getting up to and what your role entails. So we're going to start off with Chris introducing himself and uh, what it is that he does and how he got there. And then after that, we're going to open the floor to some questions. Now, we have had some questions opened in advance, but if you'd like to suggest a question yourself, you can type it into the comment and then we can ask that question to Chris. So, Chris, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you do? I would love to. Okay, um, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Ogunlacy and I am a PhD student at the University of Southampton, uh, specified, currently working on uh, high temperature materials for a thruster, for an electric propulsion thruster. Um, but I can get into that in a sec. First, I can give you just a little bit of background on me, kind of like how I got here and all the cool stuff I've done up to here. So uh, Sophie, could you put up? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, um, so yes, this is just kind of like a mishmash of the things I've done, but just to give you a little, little bit of background. Um, so I did a master's in material science and engineering at Imperial College. Um, and while I was there, my master's project was working on the skin of the Skylon space plane for reaction engines, where they, when they were still pursuing um, doing Skylon where they wanted to make the skin as thin as possible. Um, so that was like one of the first um, like real space projects I got to do. Before that, actually, um, in between my third and fourth year, I was part of the space internship network. I was a spin turn where I got to work for the Mullard Space Science Laboratory where I was working on characterizing uh, CubeSats. But none of that is in this photo, I just realized. Um, I guess the real first taste I got of working in the space industry um, was a couple years after my master's imperial where I went to work at the European Space Agency. I was part of a scheme they have which is currently open called the Young Graduate Trainees where I spent a year working in the, it's called ESTEC, it's the, it's kind of like the European Space Agency's technical hearts uh, in the Netherlands. And I spent a year there working in the materials and processes section, um, working on the Bepi Colombo mission. I was looking at specifically um, corrosion of certain aspects of that, corrosion of certain um, parts of the satellite. Um, and it was amazing. So that photo in the bottom right is me in my lab in uh, Aztec. And you can see me wearing my lab coat because I uh, was working with some pretty dangerous chemicals. Uh, and in the background, that green thing you can see is, it's a rig to test for something called stress corrosion cracking. And part of my YVT as well was getting that, it had been there for a while, it's the only one of its kind in the world, was getting it back operational and using that for testing as well. And it was just amazing. I got to work in this place with like a hundred other young, passionate people. I got to work on things that is currently flying to Mercury. It was amazing. Uh, and as well as that, so the photo on the top, is me in uh, ESOC. So that is the European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt, Germany. And we got to go there and kind of like see the mission control. I don't know if you can see, but I am the extremely handsome person in the green uh, at the back. Um, and that was just really cool getting to kind of see where everybody controls all these satellites from. Uh, and the photo just below that, uh, next to the Stormtrooper, uh, that's just another, so my love of space kind of started when I was young and I watched Star Wars and it went all downhill from there. So I was very excited when uh, Matt Taylor, the head product scientist for the Rosetta mission, one day came to work dressed as a stormtrooper uh, and got to take photos with people. And that's just the kind of cool thing that happens when you're around people with the same passion. 
Um, but after that, uh, that leads me to the photo on the left. That is, I am now working at the University of Southampton on my PhD. Um, and this is combining both my love for space again and uh, my background in material science engineering, where I am looking at how to properly characterize 3D printed parts for use in a thruster that we're designing. Um, the thruster is called a resistor jet thruster. It's uh, the simplest type of electric propulsion thruster. It's basically a hairdryer, but for space. And I am looking at characterizing um, both the way that we 3D print it to make it as um, efficient as possible and as optimized as possible for to get the best performance out of this thruster. And at the same time, looking at the super high temperature, that temperature materials that we're looking for, because we're trying to reach temperatures of up to, I think maybe about three, just below 3000 degrees. So it's really great. I get to work with such really interesting things on a really interesting topic using my hands. And yeah, so that's kind of a very quick overview of who I am. Um, so uh, that's all I want to talk about on this slide. Um, so ah, thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, Chris. And it, I mean, it sounds like you've already had a, a pretty uh, inspiring and uh, certainly enjoyable career so far. And you know, you're, you're, you're now just uh, getting through on the PhD front of things. Um, we did have some questions come through. I don't know if they Googled you or not, um, but some of my space engineering students on our post-16 qualification that we run um, sent some questions through specifically for you and oh. having heard what you were saying uh, I'll bring a couple of them in now and then we'll talk a little bit more about what you're doing. Um, one of the students said uh, what material properties are most important to consider for withstanding the high temperatures from electric propulsion thrusters? Okay that's a really good question. Um, so in terms of like material lifetime obviously things like uh, fatigue and material strength are always important. Um, fatigue less so in the case of, I guess, things maybe like Hall effects or ion thrusters, because you're not looking at um, materials that are either experiencing huge temperature loads or undergoing kind of like specific stresses. So um, that's not what you're concerned about. Um, so maybe bring it back to myself quite selfishly. Um, I am very specifically looking at two properties. Um, one is the emissivity. So how much, if you heat it up, how much heat does it radiate? And the resistivity, which is that intrinsic material property, which kind of determines um, how much resistance that material has to electric current being passed through it. Um, for the resistor jet thruster that we're looking for, both, the, both of those things are very important because the resistivity kind of determines how much current we need to put through to reach a certain temperature and the emissivity um, determines the structural temperature that we get to, and that determines the temperature that we can heat the gas to. Um, to take it a bit more broadly as well, I guess, um, we are looking at very high temperature materials. So another thing we really need to consider is what temperature can these materials stand up to. Um, so for example, we started printing low temperature prototypes because we have a metal 3D printer here at the university. Um, so we started printing in something called in stainless steel, but a specific grade of stainless steel called 316L. Um, that's, you know, that's not important. It's just, I like to show off that I know the names of things. Um, but that can operate at maybe comfortably up to temperatures around 900 degrees Celsius. But that's the low temperature one. We are aiming for temperatures of just below 3000 degrees. So for that, we're looking at a specific class of materials called refractory metals. So that includes tantalum, tungsten, tungsten, uh, niobium, molybdenum, and rhenium. So those are the kind of like five materials with the five highest melting points. Um, and that's what we're looking for, but that comes with its own problems because those, because they can withstand such high temperatures, they're very difficult to manufacture. So it's kind of a, a lot of this work as well is also kind of a play off, trade off between like, can we get the materials properties that we want versus how easy is it to manufacture these materials? Um, so ease of manufacture is also a thing that very much needs to be considered with um, material selection. Um, sorry, that may have been a very long winded answer. 
No, that, that was a brilliant answer. And I can, I can tell you in terms of the materials side of things, that ties in very nicely with a lot of what my students have to learn. So oh. thank you for that on a, on a selfish point of view. Uh, that was from Tom from our first years. Um, one thing that uh, interested me, you mentioned about 3D printing. Yes. Now, obviously, a lot of people are probably familiar with 3D printers, might have seen one in action. I've got one in a box back there that I've not put together yet uh, that I'm excited to get to use at some point. But you're obviously talking about working with, you know, metals and things like that. So how, how does that work in a, in a 3D printer sense? Is it very similar or is it quite specialised? Um, so the 3D printers that maybe most people are familiar with are the kind of like maybe the desktop ones, which heat up, um, which have a thread of like a, a filament of plastic, which is fed through a nozzle, heated up and then injected onto a plate and you keep doing that repeatedly until you build up a 3D part. Um, there are lots of different types of metal 3D printing, some which follow a similar um, process of what I just described. So you can get a metal wire heated up and deposit where you want. Um, the type that I am looking at is I think also probably the most commonly used type of metal 3D printing. Uh, it's called selective laser melting. Um, and what you do with that is basically you get this big box um, and you fill it with metal powder um, and you melt that powder with a laser very specifically where you want. Maybe I should jump back a bit and say, um, first, you take what you want to design. So you have a 3D model that you design on a computer and you import that into a special kind of software. And that software slices that 3D model into hundreds or thousands of layers, each, um, let's say, micron stick. Um, and then you import that into the 3D printer. Then you get that um, powder bed of metal powder. Um, and the laser takes the first one of those slices and melts the powder according to um, exactly where everything on that slice was. And then the powder bed lowers slightly uh, you add a new layer of powder and then you melt it again. And you keep repeating that process over and over and over and over again until you've built up this complete metal part. Um, and what's really cool about 3D printing, or at least cool in terms of PhD for me, is that um, this is still a relatively new process and even more so, it's even more new in sense of how much is being used for, let's say, rapid prototyping of things nowadays. So there's still a lot of properties that aren't very well understood because with traditional manufacturing, things are like, we've been casting and machining things for however many years. So we really understand all of the material properties that come with those kind of materials. But when you are 3D printing something, you're melting it with a laser and that changes the internal structure of those metals quite a lot compared to those other ones. So you get really unique properties compared with maybe cast materials. So for example, I mentioned fatigue life. Typically, fatigue life of 3D printed parts can be a lot higher compared with cast parts because, well, for reasons. Um, but you get a lot of like really interesting properties with that with um, metal printed parts you don't get with um, traditional parts. And yeah, it's overall, it's cool. That's kind of what I wanted to say. It does sound really good. I mean, you had me at lasers, to be honest. <laughs> uh, as soon That's as you said how I got power it. laser, you have absolutely got me there. Um, but it's it's fascinating to think just how quickly uh, research and development and production is, is jumping as we're getting uh, better and better at, you know, designing things for manufacture and for kind of replication purposes. Mm. So it's, it's uh, I imagine it's a really exciting time to be in your area because you've got new advancements in manufacturing technology coupling with a potential new era of commercialized space flight and, yeah. and things like that. So I, I would have I would have thought that uh, you must be jumping for joy a bit at the moment that you've gone into it at this point in time. Um, not to toot my own horn, but I if this is a YouTube live, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, <laughs> so one of the cool things is that I mean, I can think of two separate things. One is when I was back at ESA, um, a thing that we had in our section that, that we like to show off was a metal strut that had been um, made through uh, machine learning. So instead of it looking like the traditional struts where you would have, um, like you through made through traditional machining, so you would take a block of metal and remove parts, 
um, this was made by a computer and the computer predicted exactly where you would need to have the highest strength and printed only there. So you get this very natural organic looking structure that's actually also very strong. Um, but that's on the other one side. The other side is you mentioned that this is a very new thing and um, something I recently got was that I am getting the chance to send some material samples to the International Space Station um, to test how as manufactured parts, how they are affected by the space environment. Because this is, it's one of those things like materials is being used more and more, especially in space. I mean, 3D printed materials, but there's still so much we don't know, including how they are affected in space. So yeah, expect my paper in a couple of years on the effects of space environment on 3D printed parts. I, I definitely look forward to that. And, and so I, I imagine there must be some people like me who are wondering, so how do you simulate the space environment or how do you, you know, uh, recreate the kind of conditions that these materials would be facing? Um, that's a really interesting question and a really challenging one as well. Um, so in that presentation, in that um, slide I showed, um, the one on the left was me fiddling with some parts. Um, and that was me fiddling with parts in our vacuum chamber that we have at the university. Um, so something that we can, we are quite lucky to have is to be able to um, kind of simulate the space environment, which means putting it into this chamber and reducing the, and evacuating the chamber until we get to similar pressure levels that we see in space. Um, another thing that we can, are quite lucky to do is that we can simulate um, the kind of temperature environment that they're gonna see. So when something is orbiting the earth, obviously it's either in view of the sun, in which case you can get heated up to quite high temperatures, um, or it can be shadowed by the sun, by the earth, which means that it's facing extremely low temperatures. So um, that's a thing that you may also need to be able to simulate. So getting heat, like you need to either have heat lamps to heat up very high or to have a maybe cryogenic surface that you can just kind of remove heat so you can simulate the coldness of that environment. Um, I think back at Aztec, they have a material section which is dedicated specifically to um, replicating the space environment. So as well as those things, you've also got to consider things like how much radiation is this material going to face? And um, you can test that through, um, we have ways of on-ground testing how much radiation material might face, or um, is this material going to outgas? So does it contain, does this material like plastics commonly contain quite volatile materials that when you put them in very low pressure, they will give off these materials. And in worst case scenarios, if that is, let's say, within a satellite which has a optical part, um, that outgassing material can then condense on a, maybe a mirror or a glass surface and ruin the optics of that. So that's another thing that you can do. So you can put your material into a vacuum chamber, evacuate it and have a condenser plate above the material. So you can kind of measure both the rate at which material condenses onto it and how much material condenses onto it. You can see whether that material is fit for space application or whether or not it needs to go through maybe kind of like thermal cycling process and outgassing process before it's fit for um, use. So not as easy as it might initially sound and I think people often don't don't realize just how harsh an environment it is and what an environment of extremes it is. Uh, it, it's, it's something that in the natural environment on earth, you're never gonna be able to properly replicate. So yeah. I know down at Ra Raoul Space, they also have a similar thing to what they have at Aztec where I like to call it their, their space simulation chamber where they basically can you know, replicate this. And they put whole satellites in there and cycle yeah. through the day and night cycles and, and things like that. It's, it's fascinating to, to look at. Um, we have had a couple of questions, both from my own students and there's a question in the uh, YouTube questions. Uh, the YouTube question comes from Notorious, spelt K-N-O-W, like that name. It says, I want to work in the space industry on propulsion or something to do with spacecraft. But I'm wondering if I should do aerospace engineering or physics first and then specialize. What do you think is the best route? Uh, I am going to give possibly the worst answer. Uh, and say um, both are possibly applicable because it one it may come down to simply what you think you would enjoy more doing. Um, now that I think about it, actually, 
Um, maybe aerospace is specifically more applicable. Um, again, to toot my own horn. So the University of Southampton runs an aeronautics and astronautics course and has a module specifically about propulsion. Um, and because we have a vacuum chamber here, we get to do a lot of hands-on work um, in propulsion. So if you are interested in propulsion, I would say maybe aerospace engineering is the better route to go down purely because you will get more direct experience and specifically, which might be very helpful, more hands-on experience, um, which is very, for recruiters, is a very good thing to see, basically. Um, experience in a lab, specifically with propulsion. Um, but if you are interested in the more, let's say, simulating side, um, then physics could be a good option for you. And then you can either specialize with a master's later on, or um, you can find a job that's physics related, but still has applications in the space industry later on. If you want to go into propulsion and you are certain of that, then maybe aerospace, but it's open to you. Both routes can lead to propulsion, basically. Excellent. And I have to say, I'm really glad that you said that because that's largely the advice that I give to young people and my own students when they ask this. You know, I have uh, friends of mine who were on my degree when I was at university. So they did physics with astrophysics or physics with space science, who are now working as engineers uh, because it's the, the core skills that they learn. It just depends on if you're doing something super specialized, like, as you say, propulsion than doing an aeronautics course or the astronautics course at Southampton, which is very popular as an option, uh, potential option with our students. I can tell you that much. We've sent quite a few your way. Um, ho hopefully they're all doing well and enjoying that. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to key skills. It's going to come down to applying yourself and it's going to come down to getting as much hands-on experience either at university or through internships and summer programs and things like that. So uh, no, very good question and a very, uh, very popular question uh, for these Q and A's. Um, we have a, another question here. Uh, this is saying, what did you want to be uh, when you were younger and did you ever envisage that you'd be here on your career path? Um, it depends how much younger, because if you mean very younger, then Spider-Man. Um, <laughs> if you mean, um, so when I was about 13, we had to take a careers test in school. Um, and I did the careers test and the result it showed was aeronautical engineer and it had this picture of all these people working on this engine. And then um, my first thought was like, wow, that looks just like um, the pod racer in Star Wars. Like that's the kind of thing I want to do. And so, I knew from quite a young age that I wanted to go into space, basically. Um, but that I know people in the space industry who wanted to work in space when they were when they were thirteen or younger. I met people who didn't know they wanted to go into the space industry until they started doing a PhD in it. Um, it's not like you are not barred from entry, basically, with what you have or haven't done. It's more about the applicable skills that you have learned on the way. Um, so like I said, my background is in material science and engineering. That isn't specifically related to space, but I found opportunities to apply materials engineering to space. Um, but yes, I, I did know that I wanted to be a space engineer from a young age and maybe astronaut, we'll see. Applications open next month. They, they very much are. And you will have you have the right level of uh, education experience uh, and uh, working experience for it. So uh, go for it. Do it. Keep your fingers crossed. Um, another question. Now, this one is, is a little bit more um, specific and I'm not sure how much you'll know about this uh, coming from materials uh engineering background but uh raj on the youtube comments has said uh when do you think we might see nuclear reactors powering electric propulsion thrusters that's a good question and um you're right i'm not 100 percent sure if i'm being completely honest um let me think about like most developments in uh electric propulsion thrusters so it depends what kind of electric propulsion thruster you mean, I guess. So we've got the kind of like 
lower grade electrothermal kind of thrusters, which I'm working on, which really don't need that much power. And I guess on the other end, you're looking at interplanetary missions like the T5, T6 thruster that's currently on Bepi Colombo, um, which also, I guess, doesn't require nuclear power. Um, if I'm being honest, I'm not really sure. Um, that is a future maybe I would like to see, but um, solar cells are getting more and more efficient with each passing year. Um, so in terms of whether or not we need nuclear powered um, electric propulsion, um, we may not, I guess, is what I may have to say with that. Um, yeah, sorry if that wasn't the answer that um, people were hoping for. I guess I kind of do also have in my head the idea of like nuclear powered rockets cruising their way to Mars. Um, but yeah, not 100% sure. I have to think about that one. Yeah, I think I think it will depend on an, on a few things. I know the European Space Agency has been hesitant to use um, nuclear sources uh, mm. in the past, and generally goes for solar on on their missions. And I mean, the thing is, nuclear is incredibly efficient, but it is not really a renewable source. You're having to dig up your plutonium and then uh, use it. And I know that we're running out on the right fuels for the the um, generators that they use on missions like Curiosity and Perseverance. Mm. So uh, I think, yeah, the focus very much is, is on improving the efficiency of energy generation through solar and maybe more importantly, energy storage. If we can crack the energy storage issue so that we can keep all that energy that we're getting when we've got full sun, then uh, that's a, a key one. But it is an interesting question. Yeah. And, uh, it's always, always good to think about future developments. Oh, Malika on uh, our YouTube stream says, please apply to be an astronaut. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, I, need to do I that. definitely will. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, we're nearly out of time. This has flown by, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> one last takeaway, then. If you were, if I was a young person watching this stream who is maybe making my decisions about A levels now, and wants to work in some, you know, in the space industry, what would be the key bit of advice or bits of advice you'd give me? Um, so kind of things that I wish I knew when I was younger. First, um, depending on what you want to do, so let's assume that you want to kind of go into like engineering, maths and uh, science are very important, spe specifically physics, really, but physics and chemistry um, are really important. Or if you are interested in maybe a more life science kind of route, like you want to go into like space medicine or something like that, then uh, biology is also very important. Um, but the maths and sciences, kind of the STEM subjects are key um, for at a level level um, and internships are really really helpful to get if you can find an internship so for example I said I did the, the UK government one the space internship network they run an internship scheme uh, every year where they have quite a lot of opportunities for young people to kind of take their first steps into the space world that's a really good way of just learning what it's like, like what kind of jobs are out there, what kind of um, work you may or may not want to do. Um, those are the maybe main pieces of advice I could give. And just stay interested in space. There's a lot of new developments coming up all the time, whether that be in advances in ads manufacturing or advances in human space flight, or even things like Starlink. Um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of jobs available in the space industry sorry this answer ended up being long um but engineering is by far not the only way into space there is journalism there is art there is um life sciences there is law there are so many routes into space other than just astronaut or engineer so if you are interested in space but those things aren't what interests you then that's not the end there's still a way in Sorry. Amazing. Oh. No, what a great answer, Chris. I, I heartily agree with everything that you have said there. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really, really interesting. Thank you for having me. This is so much fun. Yeah, I really like this idea. Like I said, it's such a good idea. So thanks so much for having me. Uh, we'll definitely be asking you back, no doubt on that. Um, and remember, everybody, that you, there are more of these Q&As coming up, showcasing a range of different careers 
within the UK space industry and space sector. So you can either watch back our previous ones or you can have a look at the ones that are scheduled for the rest of the week. They're all here on the National Space Centre's YouTube channel. Uh, and if you want to find out more about things like the spin internship that Chris mentioned, uh, routes into it, maybe even our post-16 space engineering course, then you can get in touch with the National Space Academy on Twitter at UK Space Academy, or you can go to our website, National Space Academy org where you can fill in a contact form and we can get back to you so uh chris is, have you got any um links you'd like to share quickly any would you like people to be able to follow you on twitter uh, i don't i personally don't have twitter but an organization oh. that i work closely with does um it's called stem the violence we're aiming at promoting stem for youth particularly in the 14 to 17 range um so we've had a lot of really interesting talks and have more coming up um so yeah, stem the violence on Instagram and Twitter if anybody wants to see what we're doing there. Fantastic. Well, Chris, once again, thank you so much. Good luck with everything. And to everybody at home who's been listening, thank you for your questions. Thank you for watching along. Uh, stay safe and check out the rest of our Q&As. Thank you very much. <laughs>